Now our journey today will take us eventually to Bambara Castle when we shall reiterate the story of the conversion of King Edwin. Of course King Edwin is linked with Edinburgh and an event in the Sherwood Forest which I shall share with you in a little while. But here is the River Alne that flows into the North Sea and the cross on the hill depicts the situation where once the church stood until uh, flood waters covered this area and necessitated the removal of the church and the churchyard and the cross is a, a symbol of what was once where the church stood and where of course it was a symbol of Christianity here in on the Northumbria coast so in a little while we shall be traveling north to Bamborough Castle to give you the story of the most remarkable conversion of Edwin, King Edwin. Thank you. Castle of Bamborough. Let me just give you some dates to begin with. AD 597 when the arrival of the mission from Rome when St Augustine landed at Ebbsfleet in Kent. 625 AD St Paulinus was sent to Northumbria. AD 627 Edwin King of Northumbria was baptized by Paulinus. AD 63 was the Battle of Heathfield or Hatfield and sadly in that year King Edwin died. Now it was due to the Northumbrian area that the Roman mission was sent in 597 AD. We remember the story of Gregory the Great seeing in the marketplace at Rome angel faced boys from this area so he was determined to send a mission to the land. Saint Augustine was chosen for the work but it was Paulinus who eventually came here with the message of the gospel. It was here that was the seat of authority of King Edwin and in a little while we'll tell you about his conversion and all the wonderful events that took place in this part of the UK. This is Northumbria, a land on the northeast coast and I'm sure you'll be thrilled when you listen to the story. Amber Castle in the background, the home of power and seat of power of Edwin, from which we have Edinburgh or Edinburgh. And Edinburgh, of course, is named after King Edwin. Our great interest on this occasion is to share with you how he came into a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Edwin was a very cautious man and that's why when Paulinus visited him in uh, AD 627 that it took quite a time for Edwin to be convinced that Jesus Christ was indeed the Son of God. He liked the Christian religion but he didn't fancy worshipping Christ particularly but that was to dawn on him and eventually he became a committed Christian. Edwin was a ruler of many talents and it is said that during his reign after his conversion and I quote you uh, from Venerable Bede who incidentally died in 804 a woman with her babe might walk scatheless from sea to sea in Edwin's, Edwin's day that meant from coast to coast and also Edwin insisted that where the water was provided in wells and rivers that was good for drinking that cups were provided there and chained there and we understand these were never stolen but they did provide for thirsty passengers and thirsty travellers. King Edwin entertained Paulinus. Paulinus came into the UK into Kent 
around 601 AD and he came at the Lord's instruction to visit Edwin. Edwin heard the gospel in the castle but he was not persuaded. In fact he was very angry and indignant to learn that he was a sinner and that Christ had come to save him. And so he threatened Paulinus with a beheading if he was ever seen in Northumbria again. But Paulinus made his way south and God gave him a very vivid vision. And that vision was to return to Bamborough Castle and give Edwin a second opportunity to become a Christian. Uh, Edwin, of course, received him, but then an amazing thing happened. While Paulinus was opening his speech on that second occasion to Edwin, the curtains moved and out ran a little girl of about eight years of age, and this was Edwin's granddaughter. But it was soon very obvious to Paulinus that the granddaughter was deaf and dumb. Whereupon, King Edwin said to Paulinus, if your Christ can do all the things you told me, can he not cure my granddaughter? Paulinus took up the little girl, placed her on his knee, covered his, her ears with his hands, and prayed the prayer of faith. To Edwin's complete astonishment, the little girl covered her ears afterwards because sound had come for the first time and she could hear. Whereupon Edwin called the whole family, testified of the miracle he had witnessed, and they all bowed their knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paulinus, in a hurry then to go south, made his way down towards the River Trent. But as he arrived there, he learned that King Edwin was chasing after him on horseback. Evidently, Edwin met with an accident in a little hamlet today that is called Edwin Stone. It was to this hamlet that Edwin gave his personal name, for they attended to him and he was able to go down into the area of the River Trent and catch up with Paulinus. Paulinus, fearing the worst, felt that this was his final opportunity, but it was granted to him, and there he had the joy of baptizing Edwin. He then returned with Edwin uh, at Edwin's urgent request to begin to evangelize in Northumbria. It is said that in one spot, which we hope to put on record, he baptized no less than 3,000 Northumbrians in one day. That was about AD 6 to 7. And so we praise God for Edwin's testimony and his ministry. Let me just read some more from the report of his life, finally. Uh, Edwin, we understand, uh, was baptized in the presence of his uh, followers and he was remembered to be a tall man of stooping form. No mention is made of any inability to make himself understood by the North Indians. But it is suggested that Paulinus may have bumped those slaves that were originally in Rome, who were then Christianized by Pope Gregory and sent back to their home area to witness for the Lord. And so the English slave became the English evangelist. And we thank God for the testimony of Paulinus throughout this region, who is to leave an impact in so many areas. There will be more about Paulinus later in our coverage of this particular community. But that is the story as it is related so far. We hope to go and visit the area where Paulinus baptized the number that was mentioned on the record by Bede. And I'm sure you will enjoy what you will soon see.
We just just met okay. and uh, yeah. uh, Paulinus was a, a slave in Rome, and when Pope Gregory came into power, what he did he talked to the slaves and found where they came from because they came from all quarters of the earth for the Roman Empire, and uh, what he then did he taught them Christianity and allowed them to go back to the country of their origin. All right. So then they took the message back from the country from which they'd become enslaved. They were enslaved for various reasons, we won't go into that. And uh, Paulinus came back to the UK uh, because it was here where he originated. And of course, he was very much drawn to this part of the, uh, of the United Kingdom. Northumberland. Uh, Northumberland, yeah, <laughs> you are. Was it he who said, who, when they saw the fair hair, and who said, said, and, Said Angle is but angels. angels. Yes. yes. And the Latin is said Angle. And that, that's where you get the two double words Anglo Saxon. That's from, it. actually. Yeah, yeah. There you go, Michael. Wow. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> oh, good, good mark. Good point. Uh, good mark. <laughs> 10 out of 10. And who <laughs> baptized? They'd just well, been reading. Well, this is the amazing thing about it, and this is we'll be discussing this on the way. He actually baptized three thousand people in, in this place. Yeah. And you say, well, where did three thousand yeah. people come from in a community like this? Couldn't get in the bus. I mean, we've been discussing this, and they come to the conclusion that the Black Death must have hit this area badly, and the Black Death. You know, uh, in the mm. 1600s, yeah. took nearly all the agricultural workers away mm -hmm. uh, from England, because I've concentrated on that down in Derbyshire. Yeah. Because right. in Derbyshire we have a village called Ian, and the Black Death was brought from London to Ian in mm. some materials by a tailor, Never. and he he came back to the village, not knowing, you see, what he was carrying, and. The material was in the cottage for a while, and then they put it in front of the fire to dry it out oh, so you could make the materials, and then that put the thing alive. Freeze uh, it, probably. Yes, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yes. Very interesting. And, and uh, half the population died in yeah. the village. But to save the plague going into Derbyshire, because it didn't touch Derbyshire as a whole, but to save the plague, what happened was this. They had a river running through the village on the outskirts of the village, and so the people would bring the food to the edge of the river, and then the, the it people, down. they'd walk through oh, the right. water. Yeah, right. You see, because that was mm -hmm. the borderline to gather the food, but nobody touched anyone. Uh, you see, that, that's how. They, and the only one who really survived well was the vicar of the village church for summary. Well, we believe it was his faith in God that kept him alive because he buried most of the people. Yes. And you get large families in Ian of 12 and 15 people. But once the plague hit the family, that was it. They were all counted yeah, out then, you see. Uh, and I feel the plague was in this area as well uh, because that's why all the agricultural